Hi, in this virtual lesson we're going to be discussing primary and secondary succession. And we're going to be doing so with the article, uh, The Birth of an Island. Now when we talk about the birth of an island, what, what does that mean? Where do, we, where do we get new islands from? So like a mommy island and a daddy island have like a baby island? I don't think it works like that. Well, maybe a part of a continent could break apart and drift off, or uh, you know, maybe we could have man-made islands like we do in uh, Dubai. They don't have the United, United Arab Emirate there. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at another way that uh, islands are made, and this is very interesting, and scientists are very excited uh, about this birth of an island. Let's look at the article. It says, imagine inviting people to a party and then waiting years, maybe even decades, for your guests to arrive. That's what it's like for scientists pacing the shores of one of Earth's newest islands, Surtsey, off the coast of Iceland. So scientists are very excited. They're, it's sort of like you're having a party, and you've invited all, all, all your friends, or you know they're coming. You've got the chips, you've got the pop, you've got the balloons, and you're waiting. And you know they're going to be there. It, they could be here in the next five minutes, or they could be here in the next 500 years. But you know they're coming. Same thing with these scientists. They know their guests are going to arrive. What are these guests? The guests are the life forms that are slowly beginning to live on this barren island. Scientists have been waiting and watching for over 30 years. Now this article is a little bit older. Now Surtsey, this brand new island, has been around for over 50 years. But after 30 years of waiting and watching and studying, let's see what life has shown up there. Because to begin with, this island is entirely abiotic. There is no life, nothing, not even dirt on this island right now. So they're slowly waiting for life to arrive. After 30 years, let's see what showed up. First, it was the mosses. Then came the sea sandwort, a relative of the cactus, which makes its home on the shores of many Arctic islands and land masses. Over time, grasses, flies, and a number of ocean birds, many of them gulls, followed these sturdy pioneers. So, after 30 years of waiting and watching, they got a bird, a bit of moss, some sea sandwort, and a couple little sprigs of grass. So not a whole lot in 30 years, but nature moves a lot slower than many of us may expect. And, uh, uh, but life can be, needs to be very hardy to be there, in the, uh, to be one of the first living things on this island. But where did this island come from? Back on a cold November day in 1962, the island of Surtsey was just beginning. That's when the crew of a fishing boat first noticed the rotten egg smell of sulfur compounds. They also saw the ocean surface bubbling like water in a pot. About 6.5 kilometers away, deep down in the ocean, a small underwater volcano was erupting. Plumes of ash shot as high as 9 kilometers into the air the next day. It took four years before the volcanic activity finally stopped. When it had, Earth's newest landform, named Surtsey after the Norse god of fire, occupied an area of nearly three kilometers square. So Surtsey is about three square kilometers, which is not gigantic, but it's not teeny tiny either. And yes, they do have volcanoes underwater as well. Uh, just like on land, it's just that like, pushing up from the, the, the below the crust of the earth there, and it's erupting. And that's so it's made this mountain piled up ash and rock to make this island. And islands are mountains, right? They're mountains with their peaks just poking above the water. Islands don't float, just, just to clarify that. Uh, so, and named after the Norse God of Fire, that, that really seems to make sense. So we have a volcanic island made entirely of rock and ash and total abiotic material. Flip over to the back of the page. Let's look there. Looking at the paragraph in the top left-hand corner, it says, According to this web page, Surtsey was just a barren rocky surface in the beginning. Now, there are different plants and animals living on this island. The nearest living things are 18 kilometers away on another island. How do you think life appeared on Surtsey? Well, let's start with the birds. That's pretty easy. They flew there, right? The ocean gulls could land on that water and kind of keep going there. But what about the moss and sea sandwood? How did they get there? There was They couldn't have survived volcanic eruption. They couldn't have been pushed up from the bottom of the ocean. They, there was nothing there beforehand, not even dirt. Well, the first thing that was there was moss. And what does moss need? A damp rock. And Circe's got loads of that. So that water washing up there uh, would, would do that. Uh, it would transmit that moss through the ocean. And remember, scientists were pacing the shores of Circe. They weren't wandering around in the middle. They knew life would appear on the shores. It would go through the, uh, the water. 
That's where the sea sandwort came from. Because remember, the sea sandwort was on the shores of many Arctic island land masses. It, it, it'll, it'll transmit through the water. But first, it needed a little bit of sand. So we need to wait for a little bit of sand to wash up on the beaches of Circe, and then we have that, uh, that's those uh, appropriate living conditions for sea sandwort. Now, that sea sandwort grows, and it dies. It'll break down, it'll decompose, and become dirt. Right. So now that sand has a teeny tiny bit of dirt in there. And so some more sea sand where it washes up, or some more moss will go on a rock. And it's like, ooh, look at all these nutrients I have. I have uh, the carbon and nitrogen I need here. And now I can go bigger and stronger and die. And it creates a little bit more dirt. Slowly, over time, it will build up enough dirt to have more complex living things there. The birds are helping along too. The bird grabs a fish, eats it on the island, that carcass decomposes. The birds poop on the island. That, that will add some fertilizer there. Also, uh, consider if they've eaten berries or other things, they might bring the seeds with them and poop those out on the island, uh, helping Circe out there to naturally transform from a barren rocky surface into an ecosystem. And that is what we call primary succession. When we go from no ecosystem, absolutely nothing, like Circe, to an ecosystem that is slowly developing on Circe here. Now, scientists are so excited about Circe uh, because the primary succession is very rare. Earth is covered in life, from the tallest mountain to the deepest ocean. We got life everywhere. So to have this brand new volcanic island show up there, it's pretty exciting because right from day one, scientists can watch and see how this ecosystem builds itself. How long will it take? Will there ever be a tree on there? And look at the bottom of the page. There's some different animals there. You have birds, mosses, small rodents, cats. When will Circe get a wolf or a deer or a rabbit? Will it ever get a wolf, a deer, or a rabbit? Not without human help. 18 kilometers away through freezing cold ocean water, that's not going to freeze over to allow a land bridge to go across. Without human help, it's never going to be anything but birds and whatever happens to wash up on the shore or blow through the air on Circe. And it's very protective. Scientists don't want anyone on there messing that up. So if primary succession is when we don't have any ecosystem whatsoever and an ecosystem slowly develops, then what's secondary succession? Well, secondary succession is when you already have an ecosystem and then another ecosystem slowly replaces it often after a natural disaster. So if we have a massive change in an ecosystem, like a forest fire. You don't instantly have a forest grow back. You're gonna have something else in there first, or during a drought. Uh, we may have a, a, a swamp or a marshy area dry out, right? All the amphibians and fish are, are gonna die out or have to leave, and it'll suddenly be suitable for someone else. So there was an ecosystem, but now another ecosystem came in and replaced it. When I used to teach grade 6, at the end of the year, I took my kids to a camp and one year we couldn't go because a tornado hit the camp and there was a lot of damage to the area. The cabins were fine, but there were trees all over the place. We went back the following year and the lush forest that had surrounded the camp was now gone. The logging company had come in and cleaned out all the broken down trees and whatnot. The forest ecosystem no longer existed and its place was a grassland. There was these really tall grasses all over the place, and which I thought was odd. I'm like, well, there was grass here before, but it was only ankle high. But now that the trees had gone, the grass could now thrive, and the trees weren't hogging the light anymore, and they could grow really tall. All the larger mammals were gone. The deer were gone. All the birds were gone, too. Uh, most of them were. And so the rabbits were thriving. Snakes were thriving. They had a great place to hide in all this grass. So we had that secondary succession. We had a forest ecosystem, but due to the natural disaster of uh, the uh, tornado hitting it, it was replaced by a grasslands ecosystem. But what did we see growing up in between those tall grasses? There were small saplings growing back already. So that grasslands will then experience secondary succession again, and over the next 50, you know, 60 years, those trees will grow back and we'll have a forest ecosystem there again. Now, it's not just natural disasters. Uh, it could be human involvement as well. When we built this school, we had to pave over a giant field. That would have changed the ecosystem. Now we have little bugs that live on the pavement. We have uh, things growing through the pavement, or we have uh, different things, you know, just growing on the roof and stuff like that. So human involvement can also cause secondary succession to occur as well. Now let's look over uh, on the other side of the page, in the top right. There's a paragraph there. It says, when scientists visit Circe, they are very careful about what they bring with them. 
They check their clothing, their shoes and boots, and all their equipment uh, before they come to the island. Scientists are also careful when they walk around the island. They make sure they don't step on places where plants are growing. Well, we have a fledgling ecosystem. We don't want scientists to step and crush all the little baby uh, plants and mosses and sea sand, wart, and grass. That's not so cool. But why are they cleaning themselves off to go to a rock in the middle of the ocean? This is not grandma's house. And she's not going to yell at you for walking all over her new carpet with your shoes on. It's a rock in the middle of the ocean. But they're cleaning off their gear, scrubbing off their shoes and equipment before they go on there. So why? Well, they don't want to help the ecosystem. Because if they walk on there with dirt in their boots or, or, or seeds in there, that could be a problem. But that, that would help it, though. Why are we being jerks? Why should we help out this fledgling ecosystem? Well, because we want to see how it will develop all on its own. We could easily airlift in a whole pile of dirt, stick a tree in it, toss a squirrel on there, boom, we got an ecosystem. But that's not interesting. That's not exciting. We've seen a secondary succession a million bajillion times. But to actually study pure primary succession right from the start is such a rare thing on Earth. That's why scientists are so excited. And Circe isn't the only new volcanic island there. The area uh, right around um, uh, Greenland there is uh, very, very volcanic. Lots of action there. We've had other islands come up and we've had such violent volcanic eruptions that even all, a couple of years ago all air travel was stopped between North America and Europe because of the soot and ash that was in the air. But good thing the Earth's a sphere. They could just go the other way if they really needed to. But uh, it is a very, very volcanic area. So this is uh, Circe, which is an example of primary succession. Uh, remember that is no ecosystem to an ecosystem. Secondary succession is when we have an ecosystem and another ecosystem slowly replaces it, either after a natural disaster, human intervention, or just massive changes in the climate or the area. All right? So there's our virtual lesson on Circe, Earth of an Island. Just as a funny little aside, there was a mystery on Circe once. They found a tomato plant on Circe growing. And they couldn't figure out where it came from. It seemed to be growing from some really lush fertilizer there which was really odd, because there wasn't that much dirt, especially to be in a little pile like that. Circe is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's the specific area and domain of the scientific community. People can't just go and hang out on Circe. So how did this tomato plant get there? Did it come through the air? Where did all this dirt come from? When suddenly they solved the mystery. One of the scientists that was studying while on Circe really had to go to the bathroom. And a volcanic island in the middle of the ocean doesn't really have the best facilities. They couldn't make it back to the ship, so they kind of had a poop on Circe. Which really helped it out. And a tomato plant grew out of that great fertilizer that was there. And it confused scientists for a little bit until they kind of realized uh, what had happened. That was a couple little quick tidbits and fun facts to add on the end of the video.